This is the Everything 80s Podcast, and this is my complete Stranger Things Season 3 recap. Okay, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie, and it's been just a little under a week since Stranger Things Season 3 came out on Netflix, and I know everyone watches them within like nine hours, and I like to usually spread them out a lot longer, but there's a lot to cover, and I want to get the podcast done, and obviously there's crazy spoilers here, so if you haven't watched the show yet, or if you're like halfway through it, you can at least go back, listen to my preview show, and that covers you know everything, predictions, theories, expectations, all that sort of thing. Then finish the show, then come back here and check everything out. So what I'll do in this sort of complete recap is break down each episode, and I've done that over at the blog too at everything80spodcast.com. I have blog articles for all eight episodes plus like a full conclusion. So what I'll do is give sort of a summary of each episode, what we saw in it, uh, you know, hidden things, references, all that sort of stuff. So if you're looking for the complete review, you're in the right place. So let's get right to it. And we'll start with episode one, which is entitled Susie, Do You Copy? And, you know, like I said, after long anticipation, the show is back. We're diving right in. We left off from season two where the kids are at their winter snowball dance. Everything seems fine. We, of course, know that it isn't. As the uh, iconic Every Breath You Take by the police plays, we see the mind flare is still very much present. And the show finishes on the lyric, You Belong to Me, which is part of that song. Um, Obviously, he's referring to Eleven, the kids, Hawkins, all that sort of thing. So with season three, we start out in a lab. And it seems like it's the usual one we've seen based in Hawkins that was featured in seasons one and two, but turns out we're in Russia and it's June 28th, 1984. And they are testing a giant laser, which looks exactly like the one from the Howard the Duck movie, if you've ever seen that movie. And it's able to cut into what we have to assume is the upside down. So this is interesting because now the idea of the upside down if that's what we're really looking at, is a global thing, and it's not limited to just Hawkins, Indiana. So this scene looks extremely War Games-ish, if you know that movie. It's you know it's got the dual key turning. The entire set actually looks exactly like right out of War Games, so awesome way to start it. So the laser reveals something that's trying to get its way out, and then the whole thing basically blows up and vaporizes all the people around it and whatever. So it's interesting because this is the time of the Cold War and the Russian presence really opens up more of the scope of Stranger Things. We're looking at more of a worldview as opposed to just being limited to this little town in Indiana. Indiana. So we are told in Russia that the scientists and whoever's involved have one year to get things figured out. So next thing we know, we're getting a shot of Mike and Eleven making out while they listen to Never Surrender by my fellow countryman, Corey Hart. Also, we can see a Brian and Adams cassette on the table, further um, upping the Canadian content. So they're going at it hot and heavy, and Chief Jim Hopper is not impressed with this whole makeout session. So now we get a, the, the first glimpse of the Star Court Mall, which has obviously been heavily promoted in the kind of early teaser trailers and the regular trailers. And in an amazing amazing shot they reveal this mall in all its 80s glory with vintage stores like you're seeing like the original gap um sam goody orange julia like all the vintage stores are in there so the kids are on their way to a movie and then we get sort of reintroduced to lucas's little sister erica and they have this like sort of nice insult exchange that goes back and forth which is sort of reminiscent of flight of the navigator um, when David and his brother have that usual scuzz bucket butthead sort of back and forth. And we can see, you know, the mall's like full 80s fashion. We're seeing lots of 
you know, velvet scrunchies and crimped hair and pastel colors and a lot of like Memphis design influence look. The kids then sneak in to see the movie Day of the Dead. On their way into it, we can see a movie poster for Back to the Future, which is awesome to finally see that fully referenced. And we'll get way more into that later. So this means it's sometime before July 3rd, 1985, which is when Back to the Future uh, first opened. So the show's set, you know, on July 4th, but it turns out we're we're about four days. We're around the end of June at this point. So during the movie, all the power goes out. And then that continues through the mall. And then we see that all throughout Hawkins. So while this is happening as well, we get a sense that there's some electromagnetic issue um, and that we see a local steel mill. And then there's a bunch of rats congregating. And then Will has this sort of a spidey sense tingle on the back of his neck. So he knows something up is up. And that's usually reserved more for, you know, the mind flare or anything to do with the upside down. So the magnetic issue will obviously be be significant as we see pictures that have fallen from fridge magnets in the home of Joyce Byers, which is Will's mom. So I'm, I'm assuming you have seen both the first season. So a lot of this isn't news. And just in case, you're going to have to go back and check all that out. So while that's happening, we're establishing all the characters and we're seeing Nancy and Jonathan are in a rush for work. And it turns out she's kind of like an intern at the Hawkins Post, and he's a photographer. We got a great usage of Working for a Living by Huey Lewis in the news here. I'll try and point out all the songs we hear along the way. So then we find Dustin returning home, which everyone saw in the trailer. He's been away at a computer camp called Camp Nowhere. Uh, and he comes home upset that no one's been responding to him. The kids have all surprised him, and Eleven's controlled a bunch of toy robots uh, to kind of surprise him, he ends up spraying Lucas with that fair faucet hairspray that Steve uses to get his hair looking so good. We also get a shot of the pool that, again, we've already seen from the trailers. And we see all the older cougars ogling a young Billy. It includes our first appearance of New Coke, which I'll cover through the show. And you probably saw this made reference to with the campaign that Coke put out bringing back this defunct product that only lasted for a few months in 1985. And I've done a whole show on the history of new Coke. Uh, But the quick rundown is that Coke was getting killed in the eighties by Pepsi and they needed to make like sort of a splash. And 1985 was also the hundredth year anniversary of the uh, origins of Coke. So they decided to create a new formula and they're trying to match something that's a little sweeter because diet Colas had been really taking off and they have a noticeably, you know, sweeter taste due to like the aspartame and the artificial sweeteners and everything like that. So they're trying to want to, they want to replicate that because that's like sort of the new trendy drink. So they create a sweeter and new version. It does really well when they test it, but what happens when they introduce it, which was around, I think April 23rd, 1985, when they introduce it, they stopped making original Coke altogether and people flipped out. They didn't bank on the nostalgia factor of people wanting something that has like always been there, sort of like the tried and true. And it's not that everyone hated New Coke per se. They just hated what it represented. Um, So with the amount of backlash that happened, they were forced to stop making New Coke within 78 days. On July 11th, they had to stop making it. They would bring back the original formula of Coke and rebrand it as Coca-Cola Classic, which it remained up until uh, 2009, which you've probably always been familiar with. So it, it's one of the most famous and famous marketing um, gaffes of all time, but some wonder if it was actually the intent of them all along to create this nostalgia back in it. So either way, the fact that this times up perfectly with that season, with this season being set in 1985, is just sort of like a brilliant piece of... Uh, It's almost kismet, if you'd say. So what Coke did this year is they did a relaunch. Uh, They kind of recreated the original formula of new Coke. They released it in a special limited edition pack that you could get with a couple bottles of like a branded sort of Stranger Things looking um, logo and stuff like that. And you can go on the the Coke website. I think it's Coke store slash 1985. And it's kind of this like really retro setup website and when they released it like the site completely crashed it was so overwhelmed with people trying to get it okay so that's new coke so i'm just i'm a big fan of this story and it is a relatively sort of integral part of the season and it's going to pop up a lot so i'll keep pointing out where we see it so back to hopper he hates that uh, 11 and mike are hooking up he consults joyce about it 
Um, and while that's going on, Dustin has invented a super ham radio and him and the other kids are setting up the antenna on a hill so he can talk to his girlfriend, Susie, who lives in Utah. He calls the ham radio Cerebro, which is a reference to the X-Men and Professor X. And he would use a Cerebro to sort of enhance his telepathic powers. Um, and also the name, um, what is it, Weatherhood is the what they call the hill, which is right out of the Lord of the Rings. So while that's happening, we're seeing more and more rats starting to congregate at the steel mill. And then we have... Karen Wheeler, Nancy, and Mike's mom. She's planning a rendezvous with Billy. You know, it's getting a little scandalous. So while this is also happening, Nancy's really getting jerked around by the guys who work at the Hawkins Post, including Jake Jake Busey, brother of Gary Busey. His character's name is Bruce, which seems to be taken right out of uh, Jaws, which was the nickname for the model shark. So she's basically just a glorified errand girl. And... Well, at the post, we're seeing a lot of the, you know, the decimation of downtown Hawkins, which used to be the thriving business area. This is common for cities all over North America in the mid 80s as the rise to the shopping mall was killing downtown business. And it's interesting now because malls are starting to fade away to online retailers like Amazon and everything. Um, So we Nancy sees the death of local business as an issue and she thinks they should do a story about it. And she's completely mocked and laughed out of the room. Then she, she's at the office late at night and gets a phone call about some diseased rats. So that'll come up in a bit. We then see Steve Harrington, who's stuck in a dead end job at the scoops Ahoy ice cream. We're introduced to a new character, Robin, who's played by Maya Hawk, who's daughter of Ethan Hawk and Uma Thurman. Uh, Hopper now has threatened Mike within an inch of his life uh, that if he's not more appropriate with L, you know, he's really going to take things in his own hand. Uh, we see Mike and Eleven hooking up to Can't Fight This Feeling by Ario Speedwagon. Then Billy's on his way to that sort of Mrs. Robinson midnight rendezvous with Karen, and she's getting ready to I Just Died in Your Arms Tonight by Cutting Crew, which is perfectly appropriate. So then Dustin's ham radio has a much larger range, almost like Earth-like. It can go pole to pole. And they pick up some Russian code phrases being used. And that's obviously going to be important in a bit. So while Billy's on his way to the rendezvous, his car gets hit by something by that steel mill. And he discovers like a weird goo on his windshield. And then something grabs him by the leg, pulls him into the building, Fade to black, cue the end credits. So that's the first episode. I thought it was an awesome episode. I'm not gonna, there's nothing I'm not gonna like about this season. Um, I think just to, like even there's not a worst episode per se, but like even if there was a worst episode of Stranger Things, it's still amazing that we have access to it. So this was a great start to the third season. There's a lot of business they have to get to in the show by establishing you know the connection with the russians and the upside down we have to get into our sense you know the kids are really growing up we're gonna have multiple storylines we have to follow so there's a lot that's covered again introduced to the starcourt mall which is can almost be considered another main character in this season we're seeing a little more of a connection between joyce and hopper and i think this episode, Susie Do You Copy, really sets a great tone and it really captures that 80s summertime vibe well, I believe. Um, and it was interesting, like you look back at how the mall used to be the epicenter of a town and it's, you know, a great throwback as it used to be a thing where you would just go to the mall to hang out, to be seen and to see people. Like now you couldn't pay me to go near a mall. And if you are, it's just to get in and get out. But back then, this was the social hub. This is where everything happened. You know, we've jumped right into Billy and whatever his connections will be with the Upside Down. And yeah, there's a lot that's going to happen. So here's a few of the 80s references we saw over the course of this episode. We have Hopper watching Magnum P.I. And he'll kind of like evolve into Tom Selleck's character. We see Cheers on TV, which was kind of just getting going at that time. You know, we see a little R2-D2, the toys that are controlled by... Um, 11. I found, I thought the scene where uh, Jonathan and Nancy sleep in because all the power goes out and their alarm doesn't go off. And he's, he's asking where his clothes are and then falling while putting on his pants, which seems very Marty McFly and back to the future when he's in Lorraine's room. We also hear the song moving in stereo by the cars, which is kind of a bit more of a 
deep track. Uh, also, Hot Blooded by Foreigner comes up. And then Dustin's girlfriend, Susie, is referred to as Phoebe Cates, only hotter, which is, of course, from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And that references to that will keep coming up quite a bit. So that's the first episode review. Like I said, a lot to cover in that one. Um, to me, if I was giving it a score, like a letter grade, I'd give it an A-. minus. On to chapter two, which is entitled Mall Rats, which is perfectly appropriate because we have the mall, we're dealing with all the rats and the fact that kids always hang around. One of the, I mean, they're all awesome, but this is like one of the best episodes of the whole three seasons, I thought. And it really puts the 80s front and center here. So things are progressing really fast with the development of the kids, especially Mike and Eleven. Uh, we finally get to see the mayor. At the same time, Billy is uh, kind of tr- evolving pretty quick into whatever it is he's about to become. And episode two picks up right where episode one leaves off. And it leaves off. And it seems so far that the series is playing out in a actual like daily order timeline. Like we're not jumping ahead or anything like that. It, it seems to follow like a full like 24 hour cycle. So at the end of season uh, or sorry, episode one, Billy meets himself and this group of like zombies or whatever. So, you know, he goes through absolute hell after he's been dragged into the steel mill. And when he meets himself, like he has to run to a payphone. Kids ask your parents if you don't know what a payphone is. And then we see flickering lights. And anytime lights flicker in Hawkins, it's usually a bad thing. And that's when he sees the bunch of people moving down the road towards himself. And then we roll into the intro. We then see Karen Wheeler looking like she's heading for the pool. Well, at the same time, Eleven is phoning for Mike. So since Mike has been threatened by Hopper to keep his distance, he makes up a lie that he has to see his sick grandma, which Eleven is seeing right through. So you might not want to lie to a girl with telekinetic powers. Jim's plan is working. We see him eating a bowl of honey smacks. There's a lot of cereal in this show uh, this season, and I'm going to point out all the different ones. I did a whole episode on classic 80s cereals. So if you want to look back on one of uh, some of the earlier episodes, uh, you'll find that there. He's celebrating this win with Joyce. And while he's on his way, we hear this amazing song. It's called You Don't Mess Around With Jim by a guy named Jim Croche. Uh, so this is an awesome scene. So Joyce thinks that Hopper has to cut the kids some slack. Uh, he's in the store now, which is just like a ghost town because the downtown is dead. And in the store, she notices that the magnets are falling off the the wall displays there the same way it did at her, as her fridge at home. So... Interesting few things in the store. We see it's like a general store and we see a Radio Shack sign hung up, which I'm thinking Joyce took from the Radio Shack, which was just down the street, which is now closed. And that's where Bob worked. And we remember Bob from the first season. We also see, uh, speaking of those cereals, we see a few um, iconic ones, including Mr. T cereal, which was one of the highest sugar cereals ever created. We see Pac-Man cereal, a few others in there. Then we're looking back at Nancy and she's deciding to investigate this sort of issue of the diseased rats that have been brought to her attention. And she's going behind the back of her boss at the Hawkins Post to do this. So the if you've ever seen the movie Fletch with Chevy Chase, that's the big influence here. It's a story about this reporter who kind of goes rogue. He uncovers this like secret um kind of like cover up conspiracy thing. So like that, that's mirrored in the um, arc of Nancy for this season. So uh, while this is going on, Dustin is reunited with Steve and he's wanting to share everything he's found via the ham radio in regards to all this Russian secrecy. So Robin, who's working with Steve overhears all this and she's on board. She wants to decode the Russian messages. Eleven now is pissed at Mike for lying She seeks out the advice of Max, who's gone through all a similar crap because she's dating Lucas. So Max decides to take Eleven to the mall to show her what teenagers really should be doing. So we hear the Go-Go's get up and go while they ride the bus to the mall. And it's so funny looking back like that this was a thing. Like I remember getting on the bus to ride to the mall downtown. And so they're living this whole thing out. We head back to the pool now where Billy is in pretty rough shape. So Karen Wheeler confronts him in a back room and Billy imagines a scenario where he like just takes her right out with a karate kid side shop. So he's clearly infected and starting to fade somehow. 
We then see John, Jonathan and Nancy arrive at the home of a lady named Doris Driscoll. And she's the lady who contacted the Hawkins Post about the rats and all the disease. So the rats have eaten through all the, her bags of fertilizer, which is obviously not normal. She's managed to capture one of the rats that's in this small cage just going nuts. And it sounds an awful lot like a gremlin when uh, it was trapped in its cage. But that was just what I thought. We now get our first introduction to Mayor Klein, who uh, was the actor who was in The Princess Bride. And is it Michael L. was? I think that's it. So he's not impressed all the locals who are protesting the Starcourt Mall. They're saying it's killing the downtown business, which is what it really did. Uh, Mayor Klein's brought Hopper in to try and get rid of him. And since he's up for re-election, he's planning this big 4th of July celebration. So Eleven and Max arrive at the mall to the complete wonderment of Eleven, who's really not supposed to be out in public. So she and Max go clothes shopping, and we get this like perfect 80s montage clothing try-on thing to Material Girl by Madonna. We see them at a photo booth. We get this real... I've covered this uh, thing called the Memphis Design, which is... The gr- it's a group called the Memphis Group that created the aesthetic and the look of the 80s. You know, when you when you picture, like picture the Saved by the Bell logo, you know, like the squiggly sort of graphics and obscure shapes and odd color patterns. You can probably picture what I mean. I did the whole episode. Go back and listen to that one. It's very interesting. And we see this new aesthetic all over um, Stranger Things. You see it in the clothes, the backdrop, and the photo booth they're in. And yeah, just interesting to see this more prominent. Nancy and Jonathan have left the rat house, but just before that, the rat explodes, but is still able to move as like a liquid, kind of like the blob, and it escapes from the cage. It's then able to move like a lot better, and it seems to be like transforming into something that looks like Dart from uh, season two, like the demo dogs. Meanwhile, Billy's having a flashback to meeting his duplicate self that is telling him to build what we see. And... What he sees is his fellow lifeguard, Heather, before he blacks out. So Hopper has plans for a sort of non-date date date with Joyce. And at the same time, Eleven has run into Mike, Will, and Lucas at the mall, where she realizes he has lied and proceeds to dump his ass, unquote. This scene is obviously including the song Cold as Ice by Foreigner, which is just as good a breakup song as ever made. Joyce is now starting to researched electromagnetic fields and she sought out the help of the boys teacher Scott Clark from the first two seasons and he's revealed in this amazing scene in his garage to Weird Al Yankovic's My Baloney um, which is uh, he calls it My Bologna which is sort of like the parody of My Sharona by the Knack and we see um, he's explaining like electromagnetics and fields and all that stuff. And he's built a replica of the town in his garage, the same way doc Brown did in back to the future. So look out for that. Uh, Joyce has ended up basically standing up hopper for dinner. And we catch a glimpse of what looks like one of the Russian enforcers who has a strong terminator resemblance at the bar in the restaurant where hopper is. So speaking of Russia, Robin, Dustin, and Steve have cracked the code and what it reveals are the following sentences. The week is long, the silver cat feeds, when blue meets yellow in the West. The episode ends with the lifeguard Heather tied up in the steel mill with Billy about to unleash some sort of monster on her or is it a demogorgon or a demodog or a new creature altogether. Also, the girl who's Heather, who plays Heather, um, I don't know if she's been in a lot, but she was in, if you saw Haters Back Off, the Miranda Sings show on Netflix, she was the sister of Miranda in it. Okay, here's a few more 80s references in episode two. There's, you know, we're seeing more of the stores in the Starcourt Mall, including like JCPenney, the Sam Goody, Walden Books, um, Esprit. There's a Taco Bell coming soon, which is still, you know, that wasn't as commonplace as it is now, so that's kind of a big deal. It's also cool to see the Kodak Processing Center in the general store as it's funny to remember that you had to drop off film at these processing centers, wait like two weeks, and then CV actually took took good pictures. And then some of the malls would have these like kiosks in the parking lot where you could drop them off. In the in Mike's basement, there's a poster for The Thing, the John Carpenter movie, which is actually a remake of a movie from the 50s. And it's interesting because Stranger Things takes a ton of influence from The Thing. We also hear 
Matter of Love by Altitude Music during this episode. Max is riding a Madrid skateboard, which came out in the later 70s, but is the same skateboard Marty McFly rides in Back to the Future. Um, so again, you know, this is taking place before Back to the Future came out, but it's I still see it as an homage. Uh, and it would have been, you know, a popular choice for fictional characters like Max or Marty or whatnot. Um, you know, the same way, like in season two, Bob is using a JVC camcorder, which is the same one Doc Brown would use. So not in the exact like timeline, but within the context of the show, it's just like a reference, I'd say, to it. So that's season two. Amazing episode. Things are starting to pick up quickly. But I mean, there's only eight episodes in a season, so it really has to get moving. Uh, Mall Rats to me, it was unmistakable for reminding us we were smack dab in the middle of the 80s. Uh, we're celebrating mall car- culture, the, the fact it's the focal point of our lives. You know, Billy is clearly engaged with the upside down and the mind flare. Dustin, Mike, and Robin are cracking something to do with the Russians, and Joyce knows what's up with this electromagnetic field. So buckle in. I gave this episode a solid A. We now move on to chapter three called The Case of the Missing Lifeguard, which seems very sort of Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, kind of choose your own adventure type title. Wor- works for me. And actually, if you see the uh, the title for Stranger Things, that sort of type font face is, is partially lifted from Stephen King books, but also from the choose your own adventure books. So if you have a look at that, you'll recognize it. So. Let's look at a show that moves along at a very brisk pace. Uh, It's got some horror elements to it, establishes some alliances, creates some further bonds. The episode starts with a longer than usual intro and we greet Max and Eleven chilling in their room listening to Angel My Madonna. They're checking out a teen heartthrob magazine featuring the karate kids Ralph Macchio. So now they would decide, using Elle's powers, they decide to spy on the boys to see what crap they're up to and what they can hear them talking about. Just usual whatever. But they love the idea of spying on people, and they come up with all these people they know, and they play a spin-the-bottle game to see who they should spy on next. It lands on Billy, which you have to think is not a coincidence as we see how this season plays out. Eleven is able to see Billy in the steel mill with the kidnap lifeguard Heather, but... Billy can sense he's being watched and he's even able to see a slight sort of incarnation of 11 in the real world, which has not been a thing before. You know, usually when she goes into this like black subconscious thing, it's she observes them. But this time Billy is able to see her, Um, you know, like when she's been there, Mike's been able to sense her, but Billy's actually seeing her. And then we cue to the intro. This episode, we get to see the growth of will over the court. Well, the course of the series, but of this episode, because he's not maturing at the rate. The other boys are, he's not into girls the same way they are. He's still kind of in that juvenile state, whether it's intentional or he's just, that's all he knows. All he wants to do is stay in the basement and play dungeons and dragons. So they go back to their, you know, sort of roots and do one of their big dungeons and dragons campaign. He's dressed as a wizard, kind of like will the wise, we get to hear their gameplay theme music, which is the pod dance by Trevor Jones. Um, we catch our second glimpse of new Coke and that's on their table with all their other stuff. We see some awesome orange crush cans in there too. Lucas and Mike just aren't into it anymore. And Will can feel this is like slipping away. Uh, you know, while this is going on, Joyce has gone to Hopper about her thoughts of the town being under this, you know, demagnetization She thinks there's a machine that's um, controlling all the electromagnetic field, but why? And is it the people they've dealt with before from the government at the old Hawkins lab? Also, is the Starcourt Mall maybe this machine? So they break into the old lab. We get a good callback to Bob, uh, Sean Astin getting eaten by a demo dog. This one contains a lot of callbacks to season one and two, which I think works well. Eleven and Max are snooping around now in Billy's room, and they they find some of the missing belonging belongs of Heather, the lifeguard. While this is going on, Nancy's trying to share her story and theory on the whole rat fertilizer issue, um, and she's laughed right out of the room. We're taken back to Starcourt Mall, and Robin is working on decoding the Russian message as she speaks a little bit. So um, Steve and Dustin are looking around the mall for Russian spies, which is like just completely out of the eighties. We list, we hear things can only get better by Howard Jones. 
they think they spot one and it turns out just to be a bizarre jazzercise instructor playing um, to Jitterbug by Wham, which is just at the height of the jazzercise um, fad. Eleven and Max harness that water power for Elle to journey back into that black void where she sees Heather and how she's clearly in despair. While that's going on, we're seeing that um, Robin is cracked the riddle they presented and she realizes that the Silver Fox is a delivery company and it's sending something to one of the Chinese food places in the food court around 9.45 p.m. So Steve Dustin and Robin spy on this delivery but almost get caught by the Russian or special forces or whatever it is. Then Joyce and Hopper are being recorded in that abandoned lab and then Hopper gets the living hell beat out of him by that Terminator looking guard who's been following him around. So this episode features some amazing editing and like transition shots, including the shot of the security camera lens turning into the binoculars that Steve is looking through. And then as that Terminator guy is leaving on his motorcycle, it just sort of um, dissolves into Max and Eleven riding on a bike. So very cool. So most of this episode is set at night and in the rain. And to me, it had a very Jurassic Park feel to it. And Jurassic Park's been something that's been referenced a lot through the course of the show a lot. And um, so every time I see when it rains, I always get that sensation that they're trying to create that sort of tone and mood to it. So since Will's sort of so distraught over this whole thing, like people are moving on without him, he destroys his little fort called Castle Byers. And to me, that was, you know, him cutting loose any sense of his childhood that might have been left. Like he's trying to separate it and sever it. Um, that, that, that's what I got from it. Nancy and Jonathan have gone back to Doris Driscoll's house to see if they can capture that rat uh, to see what's up with it. And what we we get a clearly amazing, obvious Back to the Future reference with the black and white cat clock on the wall with the eyes going back and forth for the, like the TikTok. So that we see in uh, Doc's lab. You'll know that one when you see it right away. I'm going to assume you've seen Back to the Future. If you haven't, you're listening to the wrong podcast, so you'll have to get up to speed. But they find that Doris Driscoll is actually eating the fertilizer. So we're left to uh, assume that the rat's bitten her or something, and she's starting to evolve into something the same way that Billy seems to be. Or this could be two different things, but we'll see about that in a minute. Elle has been able to track down Heather's home. They walk inside... Uh, and who do they find but Billy sitting at the kitchen table like nothing has gone wrong. Uh, he's with her parents. And then Heather walks in like nothing's happened. She looks fine. This is actually the first time Billy is meeting Eleven. And you you can sense he knows what's up. It, it's they They can sort of play off each other that they know but they don't know. And when her and Max leave the house, we can see that Billy can now sense that Eleven closed the gate at the end of season two. So if he's in, you know, infected with the mind flayer, the mind flayer is seeing through him um, and realizing that Eleven is the one that stopped him uh, from the second season. So Billy's seeing all this transpire and then he's seeing the gate explode back open. Then Will's sort of spidey sense is tingling and he says he's back. So everything's sort of happening in this moment where Billy meets 11 and realizes what's what. Uh, This transitions into a brilliant ending where Billy and Heather then take out her parents while we hear American Pie playing by Don McLean. And this is one I couldn't put my finger on as much as I could get all the deep references. I mean, this song goes back to the 60s and even people who aren't even entirely sure what it's about then and how it plays into this episode is something I'm still trying to look into. I've uncovered a lot. That one still threw me off. So again, like I mentioned, this show whips along fast. I felt like I'd only been watching it for like 25 minutes by the time the ending came. And it's like what, 47 minutes long. So, I mean, that's usually the sign of a really good episode. Very emotional episode as we're starting to see the kids grow up and sort of separate um, from each other and how hard that transition can be, especially for Will, just as not everyone matures at the same rate. Some people just don't want things to change. 
and they want them to continue to, to be the way they've been. We're seeing more bonding between Eleven and Max and also Joyce and Hopper. See, Steve Dustin and Robin are kind of like the th- new Three Musketeers in Stranger Things, and there's you know what seems like an obvious connection growing between Steve and Robin. Even though he was like the cool guy, she was like a sort of outcast and whatever. Um, it seems clearly presented to us that we're assuming they'll get together, but this show is, you know, obviously going to throw you for a loop and not lay everything out for you. I think I covered all the eighties references I could spot in this episode. And I, I like, you know, in some of them, they're not just throwing them in there for the sake of having a nostalgic reference, which I do like, but when they do use them, they seem to exist just naturally and to serve the show. And I thought in season two, they were a little more in your face just to be like, Hey, remember this sort of like member berries from South park. Again, not that that's wrong, but last thing on this episode, if you have a good surround sound speaker system or speaker bar, crank it for this. Cause the sound design is unbelievable in this episode. I have like a pretty good speaker bar and it just, I mean, it just captures the whole mood of the show. Like you can feel it. Um, so yeah, So this episode, I give it another solid A. We now move on to chapter four entitled The Sauna Test. And in this, we look at the fact um, that maybe Eleven has finally met her match. This is a pretty straightforward episode, but finishes with a bang. And we'll see here. So this one has a bit of a slower pace, but that can be expected. Like if you're looking at this season, um, maybe in like two acts, it's eight episodes. So the first four episodes are going to move more briskly, set everything up. Then there's got to be a slight dip um, in the fourth before we kind of ramp things up and everything picks up and gets more intense. I think that's sort of like the natural um, progression and design of any play. And if you want to look at this like a two act play, that's the way I I thought it played out. Um, You know, so we look at episodes five to eight as the second act and the sauna test is, it opens on 11 contemplating everything that's just happened with Billy. As much as she's becoming a regular kid and a regular teenager, we can't forget all the powers and sort of other worldly dynamics to her. Those haven't gone anywhere. She's just trying to live like a normal um, kid in the summer of 1985. I think I still am, honestly. So Max is sharing with her on her bed two comics, Wonder Woman and Green Lantern. And again, nothing in Stranger Things is is by accident. So Wonder Woman is issue, I think it's 326. And it's about this, the story in that one is Wonder Woman traveling and meeting this sort of like God-like thing, which is very similar to the Mind Flayer. And then the Green Lantern issue is, is where he travels and meets this sort of parasitic supervillain who's able to infect and influence whatever host he chooses. Again, it's the exact same thing that's happening in this season of Stranger Things. So um, very cool that they, you know, found specific comics from that time that reflect what their season's all about. Also, I think using Wonder Woman as an influence for Eleven, uh, like Mac shows her, like, here's what a real badass female can be like. And, you know, that sort of plays into it. Um, so now we're looking at Doris Driscoll has gone full aliens mode and has been taken to the hospital. While that's happening, Heather's parents... Uh, including her dad, who's the editor of the Hawkins Post, are tied up in that steel mill. We now get our first full look at the monster for the season as Billy lets it loose on the hapless couple. So one of the theories that I sort of had and that was also floating around there was the fact that they everyone thought Billy was actually that monster. Like you saw it at the end of the trailer, the first trailer. So everything, you know, we see in also in the trailer, Billy's infected and something's moving through his veins. I think everyone thought he was going to evolve into the monster. So it turns out that one's wrong, but oh well. The monster then proceeds to attach to their face and seem to suck out their souls or something in a very human centipede type way. And then we roll the opening credits. So Hopper has finally come to take a world-class ass kicking at the hands of this Terminator guy. And that's also what Mayor Klein refers to him as later. And Mike has summoned Max and Eleven after the revelation that he's back, which was proclaimed by Will. Robin, Dustin, and Steve are trying to figure out a plan to see what's in the boxes they see delivered at the Starcourt Mall. Um, 
that they assume are the Russians when they enter, you know, they unravel that whole code and they see these guys doing this delivery of who knows what. So, um, Robin is able to get blueprints for the mall and find out that the air duct from their store scoops ahoy goes all the way to that storage room. So that um, we're also seeing the blackout again and the issue of Jonathan and Nancy being less than model employees. They end up late to work. They go into the office and her boss, who is Tom Holloway, which is Heather's dad, is not dead. Um, even though that monster just attacked in the steel mill, but he's looking in pretty rough shape and then proceeds to fire Nancy and Jonathan. Will explains that he thinks that the part of the mind flare that entered him in season two possibly stayed in their world. You remember they were able to like force it out of him, but they don't think it returned to the upside down before 11 closed the gate. So that's why he notes that every time there's a blackout, something is going on and the mind flare is still very much alive like we saw at the end of season two when it was sort of hovering over the hawkins middle school at this point hopper who's now looking extremely magnum pi tom selleck ish uh, goes to pay mayor klein a visit and he wants to know who the guys beat the crap out of him while at the same time beating mayor klein within an inch of his life he finds out that the guys involved with star court mall and it turns out the stalk the star court mall group wants to expand into east hawkins and for some reason have been purchasing various pieces of land around the area. Klein informs him that you don't want to mess with these people. So we know the mall and this possible Russian inclusion are trying to harness something with the upside down. The kids remember how heat was needed to push the mind flare out of will. And they think the same approach will work with Billy and that they can trap him in a sauna at their pool. So then while this is going on, Steve, Robin, and Dustin have convinced Lucas's younger sister, Erica, to crawl through the vents for her. So Erica is a standout character in this season. Um, you know, the total sass, the whole attitude. Um, so it plays well. And she kind of like keeps people on their toes and sort of brings them back down to earth. So the kids set up a plan at the pool to trap Billy in a sauna. It ends up in a pretty hardcore battle between Eleven and Billy. And he's actually able to get the upper hand for a bit, even though at the end she's able to throw him clean through a brick wall. And this this is an obscure one here, but when Billy's sitting on the lifeguard chair, he's wearing a Niagara Falls hat. And for some reason, again, like I don't think anything's done randomly in this show, and I was wondering what the significance of it was. My only thought is how Niagara Falls is used in harnessing the power of all the water there to create energy. So is that... What's happening with the people in the Starcourt Mall? Are they the Russians or are they or the Russians harnessing the power of the upside down to create energy or weaponry? Who knows? So Nancy goes to see Doris Driscoll in the hospital and during battle, uh, Billy's battle with Eleven, where his infection is growing, the same thing is happening to Miss, Mrs. Driscoll and she's going in the full monster form herself. Before we finish... Uh, Steve, Erica, Dustin, and Robin have found their way into the storage room and they open up one of the boxes that uh, are containing these canisters with green ooze. It's impossible to see a canister like this and not think of either the Back to the Future plutonium when Doc takes it out of the case, um, the Jurassic Park DNA where they pull those things out of the dry ice, or uh, obviously Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. Turns out they're in some form of, form of elevator, and while trying to get out, it begins to plummet deep into the earth. Then we finish with Billy and Heather realizing that Eleven knows what's up and that he could have, um, she could have killed him. But not us, Heather replies, as we see they're in the steel mill with the place filled with all those zombie-like people that Billy encountered when he first crashed by the steel mill. So... I'm thinking, you know, that the monster slash mind flare that was sucking the souls of these people is using them to create alternate versions of them, uh, which is why we have seen two different Billies. So we can assume there's two different Heathers. There's two of her parents. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, again, this is one of the theories that was put forth that the mind flare is trying to create a parallel dimension and maybe fill it with its own creations. The, the show finishes with the song We'll Meet Again by Vera Lynn, which a little little too on the nose for me using such an obvious song connection. But again, it plays well in that sort of horror movie trope of using like a 
classic charming song but it's like you know juxtaposed with something horrific um to me that's like very midnight the stars and you uh, from the shining which was performed by ray noble and his orchestra you know they take this what sounds like a light airy harmless song but when you put it in like in the in the setting or the case of the shining it becomes terrifying so i i think it works so an intense show, but, you know, obviously they all are. Didn't have a ton in the way of 80s references, except like some of like the comic book things I mentioned. But it was there primarily, primarily to serve the story um, and to see what's actually going on with the Mind Flayer and with Billy. So they've already, you know, again, they've already set up things well enough for the style and the vibe of the 80s. So they don't necessarily have to drill home um, every episode. And, you know, they have much bigger things to deal with. So it's slower pace, but not dull, and definitely finishes off with a bang. So I give this episode a B. So you can see, if you're checking the time on this, that we're wrapping it up here, and this is going to become a two-part episode. So hopefully you like this one. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe so you get the other show automatically sent to you wherever you listen to your podcast. It should be officially everywhere there. Okay, hope you like this and excited for the conclusion. See you soon.